Child Evangelism Fellowship, how the pandemic is affecting the business community, and a look into another personal story. Joy in the City is a program highlighting people and organizations having an impact in our city. All too often, we hear about the problems and the dysfunction in our culture, but we are coming with a different approach as we take a look at the good things going on right here in our community. I'm Lindsay Irvin, and you're about to see what God is doing in our city. We want to thank our program sponsors, Park Home, for the donation of furniture used in our studio, Taylor Design and Events for beautifully decorating our studio space, and our platinum sponsor, Harry's Construction, for their ongoing support of Joy in the City. Taking the gospel to every child, in every nation, every day, is the daunting task of Child Evangelism Fellowship. Carrie Biddle, the local coordinator for the South Central Chapter, shared with us her heart on this incredible ministry. Thank you for coming and, and joining with me today, uh, having a little discussion. First of all, tell me a little bit about you. Well, I'm Carrie Biddle, and I'm a born-again believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ, first and foremost. I am, um, my husband and I have been married for 24 years. We've been together 26. We have two sons. Bryce, who's 22, and Brock, who is 21. They both attend UPJ, and I'm very busy with them, as well as being the coordinator because Brock is on the starting lineup for UPJ Wrestling. So through the winter, we're pretty busy traveling, as well as um, me being the local coordinator for Child Evangelism Fellowship. Wow, so let's, let's get into that. What is Child Evangelism Fellowship? Child Evangelism Fellowship is a Bible-believing worldwide organization who's composed of born-again believers whose purpose is to evangelize boys and girls with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, to disciple them in the Word of God, and to establish them in a local church for Christian living. Our vision is to reach every child every in every nation every day. We actually are 83 years old this year. Reverend Jesse Overholzer had started it back in 1937. It was placed upon his heart, a burden upon his heart, to share the gospel with children. He was convicted to do this ministry and start this ministry when he heard a sermon from Charles Spurgeon that said a child of five years of age, if they are properly instructed, they could believe in Jesus and be regenerated as an adult. And in that conviction, he started Child Evangelism Fellowship. It was incorporated in 1937. And so our main ministry of what we do in the heart of our ministry is the Good News Clubs. They started in backyard Bible clubs and homes and in, then in churches. And then now we do by the Supreme Court um, ruling in 2001 that we could go into schools and provide Bible clubs, our good news clubs, where they're an hour and a half long. So that's what we do. And then during um, Governor Dick Thornburg in the late 80s had wrote a law stating that we, child public school age children, could um, have one hour of religious education a week. So we can take our programs as well into a release time class. So that's the heart of our ministry okay. is reaching the children through these clubs with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the focus is on uh, in, in school environments is whenever this ministry is taking place. A lot of it is. Okay. We do have various facets to our ministry as well. We have then our summer ministry where it's we have the our missionaries. I'm considered a missionary. Every position in CEF is considered missionaries. And that we have teenagers who then come and we have the five day clubs. It's the same format as our good news clubs that we perform during the school year, but we do it for five consecutive days during the summer. So we go out to the lower income housings, we help with churches with VBSs and various things. 
but in various ministries as well. And they perform that those are, are teenagers and they're from the age of 14 to college age students who actually perform the clubs okay. at, during the summer. So how many people uh, do you have involved in this, at least locally? In, locally, yeah. what we have right now, as of last year, we had eight clubs. We had together through the school year. Now with COVID, one of our clubs could not um, start because the school had the schools had closed at because it's usually in the spring. However, we typically have now eight, and we have two release time classes in in the Tussie Mountain School District. We have a release time class. We have in Altoona School District plus two after school clubs. And then we have two after school clubs in Holidaysburg School District as well. With a total of 19 volunteers and we reached 200, I mean 236 children last year. 78 of those children received Christ as their savior. Wow. Yes. That's so God is working in our area. It's phenomenal how even with this small amount, this just this summer, our our clubs were eight, we were running about 40% with COVID. However, we reached 90 children with the gospel and we had one actually 16 year old that received Christ. I led her to Christ, a very authentic situation where she was a helper at one of the clubs and at a church and she was a part of their van ministry. And in the wow. course of the, the club, she came and asked me and we went and um, she accepted Christ as her savior. So wow. that was really a neat, all worth it, you know, yeah. for the ministry. Definitely to do rewarding. That. Very you see rewarding. see those results. Yes, definitely. What, what would be uh, maybe one story of a, of a child and you've seen an impact that you could share just so, so people can get a glimpse of what this looks like in the life of a, of a kid? Sure. Uh, one of our clubs that we had is Amy Greens at Ebner Elementary. She's a school teacher there and she's a Christian. And so she conducts a club and she had been praying for this little boy at the time who was um, just in first, second grade. And he, her, his family, they know it's not the best situation. But how the Holy Spirit was leading him that day is that as they were praying for his salvation, is she was talking about the resurrection of Christ. And he stands up all excited. You mean, not like CPR? You mean he was revived? And she said, yes, the resurrection. And that day he accepted Christ as his savior. So you never know how the Holy Spirit's gonna be working in them and what's gonna trigger it. It's really exciting to see. Very much. Yes, so. So what if somebody wanted to support you and get connected, what is something that they can do to do that? We have various, um, actually, I am the only one in my office right now. My administrative assistant had left for college. So I'm in need of an administrative assistant right now. But you, we are always accepting volunteers, but we are, we are in need, the harvest is plenty. And our, our president, Lou, um, Reese Kaufman, is did the Luke 10 to initiative where we're praying earnestly for the labors because the harvest is mm. plenty. And this is a worldwide organization. Mm. And we, I'm only in nine schools of the 30, of uh, 32 in here in our, cause I am the coordinator for Blair, Bedford and Huntington counties. Wow. So we, there's a large area of where we need to reach out. So I need teachers, I need, to be willing for volunteering, you know, after school clubs. And especially with how COVID is right now, it, the ministry is changing, it's evolving. Cause we're going back to not being able to go into schools as we're speaking. So we're looking into churches. Churches could um, come and partner with us and hold the Good News Clubs at their church as well. And that um, we also have volunteers for my newsletters and helping with just administrative work within the um, 
office. Also, you can volunteer as well for the summer. We need help with drivers to drive our missionaries. Typically, I have two teams going. We have about 19 to 20 clubs through the summer, and I have two um, consecutive teams. So for that as well, now you have to have your clearances, and yep. we go through that whole process, sure. and we have our paperwork that we have to do, and as long as you meet with that, then and for training, I do all kinds of training that for the volunteers as well to come in and help good. them prepare for teaching. Oh, good. So they're yeah. not on their own? No, not at all. We actually have a wonderful support, and that's what I'm there for. We go through a training of them where we it's called Teaching Children Effectively. And I am a part of my requirements to become director. I'm actually doing everything as a director but I'm the local coordinator right now. I have to do uh, a process of education requirements sure. that I need. And I am almost done with that. But a part of that is becoming an instructor of teachers. And so I can go into Sunday, like churches and help Sunday school teachers even become and develop okay. their Bible lessons and incorporate the gospel into those Bible lessons even more. And that training I specifically is required for our teachers who are going to teach at our clubs. And then I come along aside to them and it depends on if our church is supporting them or not. I train the, all the volunteers because everybody in a club has a task to do and has a position to fill. And I train them all on what the requirements of those are. Wow, fantastic. Our clubs exist of a, um, we start with a wonder time, and that's where we do like a small group Bible, and we we counsel the children to do devotions and, and mm. you know, encourage them to that. Then we go into some songs and we do play some games, but our main focus is our memory verse. And then we have a word up that's fun that they do. And then we also have our Bible lesson as well, that in that, with that is where the invitation is given. And we teach the, the um, teachers to be prepared for that as well. And then well, how our ministry is what we use is the wordless book as our counseling. So we'll teach them and I train them thoroughly on that as well. We take it very seriously that they're teaching God's word mm -hmm. and we um, do not want anything misrepresented. Well, let me just say, I think it's fantastic what you do. Um, I was not aware of this mm -hmm. till we, we had the prayer time at your place. Yes. And uh, I think that it's fantastic. I think it's needed. And uh, I just wish you well, pray for you and your organization. And we'll see if anybody who maybe watched this can uh, come alongside of you and support you as well. Yes, thank right. you very much thank for you. having me. Absolutely. If you know a person or organization impacting our city, we want to hear about it. You can contact us at 814-944 1948 or email us at stories at joyinthecity.org. Continuing our month's theme on the effects of the current pandemic, we wanted to hear from our local business community. Matt Stuckey, owner of Stuckey Automotive, sat down with Troy and shared his thoughts. Thank you for coming, hanging Absolutely. out with me for a few minutes today. Uh, first of all, as we start, why don't you just tell me a little bit about yourself? Sure. So uh, I grew up in Hollidaysburg, graduated from Hollidaysburg High School and uh, moved away for a few years to go to college. And my first job was uh, in the Harrisburg area. But I've been home for 17 years now. So I'm the third generation of my family working in the car business. And, uh, you know, it's, time goes fast. <laughs> yes. Now you've been expanding and I've been seeing some things lately online and everything. Sure. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So, so uh, I've been running the company myself for 11 years um, and we had about 70 employees 11 years ago. And we should hit 250 on the pace we're going here this year. We're just hit, about to hit 240. So That's awesome. Uh, so, yeah, it's growing pretty good. We're actually five companies now. Um, and uh, most recently, we expanded up into State College. So Fantastic. just getting up and running up there. So, yeah, it's going. It's fun. Everybody that. needs a car, you know? Yeah, indeed. <laughs> so uh, right now, this year has been unique for all businesses, uh, sure. particularly yours yeah. as well. So yeah. talk to me a little bit about how this has impacted you and your business with coronavirus. Well, it's been uh, just a crazy year. I mean, you know, we were mandated to close our sales departments uh, uh, by the state of Pennsylvania back in March. Uh, that lasted just over a month. And so then we were, you know, allowed to open kind of on a, on a limited internet only basis. Um, and, you know, it's been quite frankly, very strong since then. Um, our service department stayed open the entire time. 
uh, you know, people did need to get their cars fixed and, and sure. maintained and, and those kind of things during that time. It's been a real challenge to manage from an employee standpoint. We were one of the companies that unfortunately had to do a, you know, a significant furlough there for, for a period of time. Very thankful that everybody's back and has been back for several months now. And, and, now, do uh, you find that people, uh, because of job situations and different things, people maybe not have uh, the money they did a year ago? Are people buying cars? back again or is it still kind of I mean we're still up? behind last year in total in total volume but uh, we've had several strong months through the summer here and uh, boy if I knew what the next few months were gonna bring it it almost feels normal right now which I hate to say because <laughs> you know but here we are in the first week of September and and uh, hopefully we can kind of just be be normal but uh, I'm, I'm not in charge of that so. sure <laughs> so from a, a business not just your sales but from your business your sure. employees your workers how has this been uh, the the challenge of all this. How has it been for your company, the morale and all that? Kind yeah, of stuff well, inside? obviously, it was not on our radar. You know, we've certainly had uh, ups and downs in in the vehicle sales market, driven by you know external forces, economics, uh, you know, uh, you know, crises, those kind of things. But certainly not something on my radar was having to completely stop selling cars. You know, we've seen the market drop by half at various times, a third. That's not unheard of. Um, so you know, it was a challenge. We really did our best to communicate through that time. And our, our employees have just been great. I mean, they've they've stuck with us. Uh, they want to work. They want to they want to do more. They want to take care of the folks in our community. That's really what we're all about is is customer service. And and our team is is very keyed in on that. They were chomping at the bit to get back when they, you know, had to take a pause there. And uh, thankfully, we've been able to to ramp back up pretty quickly. So have you? Uh, are there certain things that you have to do now that you didn't do before, as far as people? looking at cars, uh, the, the cleanliness after someone's in yeah. and out of the cars, there are certain things you have to do now? Yeah, I mean, general cleanliness was always really important to our organization. Um, I'd like to say if you come into one of our shops, you'll be surprised how clean it is. Uh, so, but we've definitely taken that to the next level and we're wearing masks and, you know, probably never bought this much hand sanitizer as I bought in the last few months, <laughs> you know, all, all those sort of things. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, you know, we disinfect fo folks' cars for them as, as readily as makes sense. and. Uh, uh, you know, it's 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 all the same guidelines we're dealing with anywhere else in in, in the outside world. <laughs> so, from a business perspective, what what is something that uh, the faith community can be praying for? Uh, as you talk to different business owners and so forth, what, what what are you hearing? What are you seeing that we could be praying for? You know, I think uh, you know, not that the good old days were always that good, but uh, you know, things things were really starting to kick in Blair County before the coronavirus, and so. Hopefully we are, you know, in the process of being back to that. If if not, we'll be back there soon. Uh, you know, certainly really tough in some segments of the of the uh, business world right now. Restaurants is probably the first thing that comes to mind. Anything related to travel and tourism. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and unfortunately those businesses being restricted that directly impacts their employees, and that's that's where that's probably the hardest part for me to 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 watch. Um, you know, and at one point be part of. Yeah. Like I said we're very thankful to be back up and going again, and and. Uh, but it, that's what's been really weird about this whole time is that there's doesn't seem to be a lot of rhyme or reason between who benefited and who was you know really, really knocked down, um, and so I don't know. <laughs> Do you guys have contingencies in the event that coming into fall flu season things may change? Do you have some plans in place that if that does happen? Well, we sure hope and hope to not have to completely stop again. <laughs> That's, sure. that, that'd be the worst. But uh, I mean, you know, the first and foremost is just making sure our employees stay healthy, and you know, we're we're talking about that daily, if not nearly daily, and you know, monitoring all the same trends everybody else is. Uh, you know, we really feel very fortunate to be in Central Pennsylvania here that has been relatively minimally impacted by, you know, by people really getting sick mm -hmm. from this virus. So. Uh, you know, but we've spaced everybody out in our offices and, and we're certainly trying to be, you know, very cautious with customers and those sort of things. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we need to move on too. And, sure. uh, and so I think, uh, you know, I think as a community, I think our area is, is starting to figure out what that balance is. Yeah. And, you know, it's a balance. Sure. Yeah. Well, I tell you, I, I appreciate what you do, not just as a, as a, a car salesman, uh, but as a, as a community member. Uh, I hear a lot of the things that you're doing uh, outside of just the business, and I really appreciate all the different efforts that you do personally, and, uh, and we're grateful to have your business in our community. Well, thanks. So, thank you for your time today and appreciate you coming by. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks. Today's Platinum sponsor is Harry's Construction, whose motto is, if you can dream it, we can create it. Be sure to visit Harry's Construction Kitchen and Bath Center at 114 Main Street in Bellwood 
You can also visit their website to see pictures of home improvement projects over the years. Our final segment tells of another great personal story from those in our community. Hello, I'm Dano, Dano Burkhart, and this is my story. Uh, first thing I always get asked whenever I meet new people is, how did I end up in this wheelchair and what happened to your legs? So hopefully I can explain that a little bit today, um, answer those questions, and sh share with you the awesome things God has done for me in my life so far. I was born with a birth defect called spina bifida, and in the early 80s, it was uh, undiagnosed you know, during my mother's pregnancy. pregnancy. And uh, I, they didn't know I, there was gonna be anything wrong when I was, uh, when I was born. It came as a complete surprise to them. So when I, my mom went into labor and uh, I was finally delivered, they noticed right away that I had, uh, my legs were crippled and, um, and the doctors came in and said, well, you know, there, there seriously is some uh, serious issues here. here. As coming as a surprise for my parents, of course, uh, this was their first test of faith. Um, this, I, they had two other sons that were, came out normal, as they say, and uh, they uh, were living normal lives at the time, and they knew that this was gonna be a, a lifetime journey, um, raising a son with a disability. And so my parents took me home, and, and you know, a couple months later, you know, I'm starting to hold my head up, and then, I'm starting to roll over, and then I'm starting to, to crawl, and then I'm starting to climb, and then climbing on everything, just like a, a normal normal kid. And, uh, and then my, you know, having two older brothers, they start beating me up, just like everybody else, you know. And uh, and I had a pretty much normal childhood up until I was about six years old. And when I was six, I got called, uh, we had an appointment at my a doctor's, and they were noticing that. I wasn't, I didn't have enough room in my body for my organs. And my lungs didn't have enough room to expand. So they ended up contacting this other uh, team of doctors that have done this surgery once before in the whole world. And they um, brought me into this auditorium with all these, this team of doctors. And they just, they were trying to come up with a game plan on how they were gonna make me taller. And to me, it was kind of exciting. They put me in an auditorium with like a hundred and something doctors and uh, I'm in this big auditorium and I'm up on stage and I'm like crawling around on the stage and on this table and, and behind me, they have all my x-rays up on this screen and they're actually figuring out this game plan on how they're gonna uh, make me taller. And what they ended up coming up with was they were going to take my legs, take my tibia bone, and they were gonna put it in my back and rebuild my spine out of my, out of my leg bone. Um, so to me, as a little kid, I didn't really understand it too much, but as but my parents, of course, were, were totally, um, totally had to rely on their faith in God at that point, that they had to trust these doctors, that they knew what they were going to do to be able to save my life. My parents started raising me with this, with a, I call it the can-do attitude. They didn't put any limits on me. Um, after a few months, after I got the cast off, I was back to climbing on everything. and. and getting on the counters and getting in chairs and, and doing all those types of things. And, and to me, was starting to become a more of a, a normal child again. Kids, you know, kids can be, they don't know, but they're are very blunt. And they would come up to me and just say, hey, what happened to your legs? You know, why, why are you in this wheelchair? Like, what, where'd your legs go? You know, they'd come up and look under my pants, you know? I was like, what are, these, what are these kids doing, you know? And, uh, and I knew I was different. And I would go home and I would tell my parents, I, you know, tell them what kind of how a rough day I had about how these kids were treating me at school and things like that. And they would always uh, tell me and always convince me that how we are uh, fearfully and wonderfully made. And uh, it's in Psalms 139. So I kind of got in my head that God was this ma magician. And I would go home and I would pray and I'd be like, God, just give me legs, you know, and thinking that, that somehow legs were just going to sprout out and I was going to get my legs back and be able to walk and be normal and be like a normal kid again and I wouldn't have all these questions again. And uh, and obviously that's not how, how God works. And I, I learned that at a very young age that uh, God is not a magician and, uh, you know, everything is, is for his, his plan in my life.
but these things are seen as, as temporary and that you need to focus on what is eternal. And, and again, I'm drawn closer to my relationship in God at this point. I know we all are. We all seek Him when, uh, when, when there's trouble. But for me, this was, okay, God, you brought me through so much already, you know, uh, from losing my legs to the, the infection to my first kidney to my second kidney that I know uh, that you're going to bring me through this. My name is Micah Marshall and I have been friends with Dan for several years now and what he's not telling you about the rest of the story is Dano is actually in the need of another kidney now. And so we are uh, looking, we're searching, we're praying, we're trying to find a kidney for him. If you are a blood type O, uh, you qualify, you're a match and we would love to be able to see if you could get tested. Hey guys, what's up? It's Dino. I just want to call and give you guys an update on what's been going on. Um, I was able yesterday to get a kidney transplant and uh, I got it uh, last night at about four o'clock in the afternoon. It was pretty cool because I actually got to see it. But man, this is awesome. I'm like so happy. It, it, everything has gone really well for the last uh, day and a half. And uh, the numbers already are coming down and uh, I'm able to go to the bathroom now, <laughs> which is a huge thing because I haven't been able to, uh, to use the, uh, go pee <laughs> in about two years. So that, that's been awesome. Uh, they also changed my diet. I can have um, all the foods that I want right now and drink as much as I want. I don't have a fluid restriction. I'm actually encouraged to drink more. So it's, uh, it's awesome. And uh, I'm just so thankful uh, for this family that decided to, to give me a, another chance at life. And uh, I'm so thankful for all of you and all the support that I've gotten. Um, it's unbelievable what God has done in my life uh, over the last 39 years. And this is just another major thing that uh, he's brought me through. And uh, I'm so thankful to him and that uh, all the glory and everything goes to him for what he's done for me and, uh, and what he's done for us and uh, it's just awesome. If you have a personal story or a testimony that you'd be willing to share with our community, we'd love to chat with you about it. Please contact us at 814-944 1948 or by email at stories at joyinthecity.org. That's all the time we have today. Thank you for watching Joy in the City True Stories. Let me encourage you to watch other episodes of people and organizations having an impact on our community on ABC 23 at 5.30 a.m. and 12.30 p.m. every Sunday. You can also catch us each week on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Until then, be encouraged because God is moving in our city.